Hey friends, welcome back. So I have some good news about these new mutations you're hearing about with regards to this Omicron variant. Now, when you hear about mutations and new variants of concern or variants of interest are often presented in a negative connotation, but there's ample evidence to suggest that these new mutations may signal the beginning of the end of the pandemic with regards to COVID-19. Now, to me, I think this is exciting. I know for many people, you want to get your life back. You're sick of all the restrictions, the mandates, the business closures, and the government telling you what to do. So if you're one of those people, you're going to like this video because there's evidence suggests that there's this trade-off between virulence and transmissibility. And as pathogens become more transmissible, that is, they're more infectious, the ability of one person to infect more people increases, that comes at an expense, and the, that expense is reduced virulence or pathogenicity, that is, the severity of the disease. So in an ideal world, what pathogens or obligate intracellular parasites, that is a virus, what they like to do is strive to find this balance between optimal transmissibility and reduce virulence, because what that means for the pathogen that is trying to amplify its ability to infect more and more people, because again, these pathogens can't live viruses, particularly SARS-CoV-2, can't live by itself. It needs your glucose, your amino acids, it needs your cells to hijack. So if it can not kill you and infect you and your family members and your friends, that's an ideal environment. And we're going to talk about some interesting new findings from these 30 or some odd mutations in the spike protein region of SARS-CoV-2 that is characterized of this new variant of concern called this Omicron variant, which again, I think is really good news because it turns out that the location of these ACE2 receptors, which are found in your own tissues, this is how the virus, sort of this lock and key mechanism, I'm making loose analogies here if you're watching on YouTube. So you have the spike protein and you have this you know, sort of female end uh, on, your, in your, on your own receptors called the ACE2 receptor. These mutations really increase this affinity. Now, in fact, let me just read to you some direct quotes from some of the papers that we're going to refer to in the show notes below here. We show that Omicron is about 10 times more infectious as the original virus and about twice as uh, infectious as the Delta variant. Now, some other scientists in the Lancet go on to say the rate of infection from this Omicron variant will be 100-fold higher as compared to Delta. So let me pause here because you're thinking, oh my gosh, if the virulence hasn't decreased and it's more infectious, that means more hospitalizations, more deaths. What about grandma? What are we going to do, right? Well, it turns out that, again, as I mentioned earlier, there's this trade-off. When pathogens become more transmissible, they usually lose some of their virulent or, or disease-forming capacity. And guess what? These new mutations have caused just that. More and more data is showing that. To the best of my knowledge at the time of recording this video on December 8th, there has been no deaths attributed to this Omicron variant. In fact, it's been a bunch of mild cases. Again, this should be good news. Now, why is it, again, as I mentioned earlier, why does this evidence suggest that this is the beginning of the end of the pandemic? Okay, let's talk about location, location, location. If, if, you're, if you know someone that's involved in real estate, They'll tell you the number one rule in real estate is location. Well, we should be talking about this in, with regards to infections. You're going to look at this image right here that shows human cold-causing coronaviruses and seasonal influenza viruses. They're highly transmissible, and they're not as lethal as SARS-CoV-2. Why? Why is that? Because they tend to infect the upper part of the airway, the epithelial tissue in the upper part of the respiratory tract, compared to the lower respiratory tract, which is where more lethal pathogens such as SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2, the Gen 1 version, if we think about the OG version of SARS-CoV-2, it, it wasn't it really didn't have a preference as to where it bind. Uh, it, it would cause infections in some people in the lower airways and some people in the upper airways, and that might have been the differentiating factor between severe disease uh, and mild disease, right? Well, so let's take a step back and talk about the, these new mutations. These new mutations foster enhanced receptor binding to the ACE2, which is found primarily in the upper airway epithelial tissue. So essentially, as scary as this new variant sounds, 30 plus mutations, it's heavily mutated. These are the things you're hearing about from pundits on television. Okay, those are good because those mutations are preferentially causing the virus to cause, to infect the air airway epithelia in the upper airway portion. As you can see here, more benign cold causing coronaviruses and influenza preferentially affect the upper upper airway epithelial tissue. Look, if you're going to choose between a cold, cold A causes a deep lower lung infection. Cold B causes an upper airway infection. You'd be a fool to choose cold A because 
that involves pneumonia, deep inflammation, pus and all that that can decrease the ability of your lungs to respire and to get rid of CO2 and take in oxygen. You want an upper airway infection. So if we just read to you some of the quotes here, um, I want to get into that. But first, I just want to welcome you all back. It's Mike Mutzel. Thank you for watching this video, listening to this in iTunes. If you're enjoying this content, please do two things. That really, really helps our channel. You can hit that like button and leave a comment below. That goes a long way. You can also share this with a friend or family member. And I do want to let you know, uh, vitamin D is really hot right now. A lot of people are taking vitamin D, but they don't even know what their levels are. So our sister company, Myoscience, we now have an at-home vitamin D test, really affordable way to do a blood spot vitamin D level right in the convenience of your home. So you can figure out like, do I even need to supplement? Am I supplementing too much? Or convince that friend or family member who's like, I don't need vitamin D, vitamins, whatever. Uh, if they're deficient, there's a lot of implications with regards to their health with vitamin D insufficiency. So I wanted to let you know, you can use the coupon code podcast and go over to myoscience.com and check out the new vitamin D blood spot test by our friends over at Omega Quant. And we're offering this and again, 15% discount on an at-home vitamin D test, which is really, really cool. So I'll link that below. But let's get into what some of the data shows about the ACE2 receptor expression in the upper airway epithelial tissue and why these new mutations, as scary as they sound, are actually good news. So as the scientists say in the article that we were talking about here, ACE2 expression follows a gradient along the respiratory tract with greater expression in the upper airway and decreasing further down. Now remember, I know I've said this like a million times, I just want to make this very clear because... I foresee this video being controversial because no one else is talking about that, that these new mutations really have occurred to optimize the ability of SARS-CoV-2 to bind to the ACE2 receptor. And again, if you think about, well, there's a lot of receptors up here, so it's probably unlikely that the virus is going to get into your airway, miss all of these ACE2 receptors and go down where they're less prominent in the lower airway. So again, what this means is these mutations have rendered SARS-CoV-2 to a cold. Like has been, you know, these endemic coronaviruses, there's about five of them that circulate. They infect kids all the time. About 40% of the common, you know, cold that people get is from these coronaviruses because they tend to have an increased ability. Again, they all, all these different coronaviruses, you know, some of them latch onto different receptors, not always ACE2. One of them, I think, is like a EPP4 receptor. There's different receptors that they latch onto, but they tend to largely affect the upper airway. So the location in which viruses replicate along the respiratory tract guides how the virus will be able to transmit and also its pathogenicity. Traditionally, viruses that bind to the upper airway exhibit lower pathogenicity compared with the, the other viruses that bind to the lower airways. So again, that trade-off, right? If the virus preferentially uh, you know, binds to the airway tissue up here, it's more transmissible and it's not as virulent, which is the optimal scenario for a virus to remain endemic because if it's highly virulent, people will die and the virus won't be able to replicate. So it's trying to seek this balance between high transmissibility and low virulence. That's usually what happens with these endemic viruses like influenza and like all the other human, co human cold causing coronaviruses. So the, the scientists want to say that testing for these less virulent human cold-causing coronaviruses typically find positive results when samples are done in the upper airway compared to the lower airway in contrast with SARS-CoV-1 and MERS that occurred in the early 2000s. Rarely were there ever samples found in when sampling in the upper airway. It was mostly in the lower airway. Now remember, those viruses were not as transmissible, but they were highly lethal. The case fatality ratio was something like 20 to 30%. So very deadly. If you got those diseases, even if you're metabolically healthy, I mean, if you got infected with those bugs, even if you're metabolically healthy, probability of surviving was, was not so hot. So in conclusion, um, one hypothesis argues that the strength of the receptor affinity may correlate with the receptor abundance in an inverse relationship, meaning that if a virus can preferentially bind here, that's where it's going to infect the upper airway. So uh, really important stuff here. I think it's really good news. And to the best of my knowledge, I haven't heard anyone really talk about this. I'm not saying that uh, I discovered this. These are scientists here at... Um, this was University of Texas Medical Branch. Um, you know, these researchers here, Michelle Vu and Vinette uh, Menachery. The, again, the title here is Binding and Entering COVID Finds a New Home. And they talk a lot about this ACE2 receptor expression 
And just to verify what some of the research that they cited, I went and, and did a lot of other research. And, and lo and behold, there's a lot of ACE2 receptors up here and not so much down in the lower airway. So time will tell. And um, so I feel a little sheepish putting this out there premature before all the experts, so to speak, are talking about it. But it seems that these mutations are actually good because that this renders this pathogen that can be pretty virulent for some people, especially if you have underlying health conditions, if you're overweight, if you're obese, if you're elderly. And if this renders this to a common cold that just causes a little upper respiratory tract infection and not severe systemic disease and pneumonia and compromising lung function, that is good news. So again, when you hear mutations, you want to think about what do those mutations do and is that good or bad? In this case, it seems that they're good. So Hopefully I don't get ridiculed too much for making this video. Again, I'm just sharing what the science suggests and I have a right to be wrong as well. I could be very wrong. I, this could be the deadliest thing that's ever been presented to mankind. And if I'm wrong, I have that right to be wrong. Just as all the other health experts pretty much throughout the world, many people have been wrong. Uh, like wrong about closing down the economy, suggesting it saves lives. It just prevented transmission or delayed the onset of that. Closing schools, really bad idea. There's a lot of iatrogenesis and there's no uh, indication that the lack of school closures in Sweden and Europe um, impacted children uh, in a negative way compared to what we did here in the US, right? So based upon this data, I really hope I'm right. And, I, and I'm sure you probably hope I'm right as well because um, we all want this thing to, to end and uh, no one wants people to get sick. Uh, you know, if this is a mild cold, then, then so be it. And that's good. So friends, what do you think about this? Do you, do you think there's any validity here? I would love to know your thoughts. Please leave a comment below. Let me know what you think. And we will catch you in a future episode down the road. Thank you for hitting that like button. Thank you for being here. Adios.